Hey everybody, welcome back to No Fear, and I am on, uh, Rodney, how many podcasts have we done together? Two or three or four between yours and mine? Uh, probably three or four. Yeah, so, but it's no longer Rodney King, the famous Rodney King, it's Dr. King, congratulations, doctor. Thank you, appreciate it. I, I, uh, um, I mean, I'm going to jump right in. I'm, I'm assuming that because you've been on my show before and, and most of the people who follow uh, me have some sort of defensive tactics, combatives, martial arts. So hopefully they uh, know your name and know what you do. And we'll talk a little bit about that after. But I want to jump. Oh, let's, let's do this. For people who don't, have no clue who you are, you're stuck in an elevator. What's your elevator speech? Hey, what do you do? You know, and, and you tell them. So, yeah, I think of my elevator speech would be that I teach a combat, athletically-based self-preservation approach. Nice. To which most people go, what's that? And then it starts the conversation. So um, That's it. Right. Yeah. So you, you develop, your, you're probably in terms of, in terms of uh, uh, branding, uh, Crazy Monkey, right? Yep. Is the, a um, little bit of origin on, on where that came from. Well, I mean, you know, just quick in a nutshell, I was brought up on the south side of Johannesburg, uh, kind of like government housing in the United States. So relatively poor environment as all those environments really violent and so forth. So I was really bullied growing up, had to have roots to get home safely, try to avoid the gangs in the neighborhood. One of the things that obviously that, you know, any kid in that kind of environment wants to learn, especially if they don't have those kinds of skills is to learn how to fight, right? You want to learn how to defend yourself. And that really put me on the road of engrossing myself in martial arts. Uh, got kicked out of the house at 17 by my alcoholic mother. I was out on the streets of Johannesburg on my own, had no future, no prospects. Enrolled into the military early, so I turned 18 in the, in the military. Uh, served in the VIP protection wing, later on in some counterinsurgents operations. I was a platoon sergeant. And then I became the lead hand-to-hand -hand combat instructor for my unit because I'd been training martial arts, karate and boxing and things like that. And then once I got out of the military, there was pretty much no job that I could find. Nobody was going to hire me. I didn't have a high school diploma. I had military skills. Nobody wanted that. And so the only job that I could find was as a doorman. And so for the next seven years, I worked outside the door as a bouncer so to speak, I eventually became the head bouncer, had over 70 doormen working for me. And I would say that it was that period, those several years where really uh, Crazy Monkey Defense came into its own. And that's really where I started developing the program from. So it was really built from the reality of having to deal with interpersonal violence. But the name, so that's, that's a great elevator speech. If we were stuck in the elevator for, I mean, that's a, a, an amazing background and obviously speaks to the, uh, the empirical, like a lot of people, you know, you know, learn the no, no offense to everyone who learned martial arts in a strip mall. Uh, you know, I did when I was 1973 and Bruce Lee passed away and martial arts kicked off in the only school was a Taekwondo school in a strip mall. And I went there and, and, you know, you lived in a, in a, in a, uh, to quote Donald Trump, a shithole. Uh, and did that get in trouble? Like, Hopefully shit, I, I got in trouble. Um, and, um, but you know, you're like at a young age going, okay, I'm thinking about like counter surveillance now without even knowing the term. Like if I go down this road, I'm going to get my ass kicked. I think that guy's following me. So a lot of it's really empirical and that's cool. A lot of people don't know that because if they just come across you online, it's crazy monkey. You know, here's another guy yeah. like teaching self-defense. And I think your story and that history is um, in many ways more important for people who want to study under you and follow your stuff because there's a, there's a like, hey, this went through, uh, you know, a real bullshit filter because it, it, it kept me alive, right? And so, uh, you know, I've, I've been following your stuff, you know, for, for years and I'm a fan of, uh, you know, the movement's the movement, but I'm more of a fan of your brain, the way you think. Uh, uh, you're, you're one of the few uh, warrior philosophers that can articulate their stuff there's a lot of really amazing people out there but you know you talk to them and and they're great at what they do and they're passionate but they can't emote and articulate and i've always been impressed with that skill that you have which leads me to my next question and that is talk to me about uh like you just got your doctorate right and talk to me like like one day you're sitting around kicked out of the house at 17 
uh, living on the streets, military, you, you're teaching a street fighting in one of the most violent areas in the world, street fighting system, traveling the world. I know um, I will, uh, I'll go get my, my doctorate. What prompted that? Like, tell me about that journey. Well, I think there's a couple of things there. Growing up, uh, when I was at school, I, I was in terrible schools. And I had the teachers that constantly told me I wouldn't amount to anything. Um, so then when I got kicked out of the house and I didn't finish high school, it kind of seemed like it was going to come true, right? So all the things they've been saying, the writing was on the wall. Um, and then, you know, I got involved, like I said, in all the things I, I did. And then eventually I got to the point where I was, I was doing okay financially and I was being pretty successful. But this thing kept bothering me the whole time, the fact that I never finished school. And anytime I was sitting around at you know, dinner tables and it would come up, you know, so what do you do for a living? And I would say what I do and people would kind of look down on me, you know, it's because all these people were college educated and I never finished school and I basically I teach people how to fight. I mean, that's the perception, right? We, me and you know that that's not what we do, but you can right. see how people kind of think that way. Of and so it was kind of, I was always, in, I, I guess I was embarrassed to be honest. And it was something that I wanted to prove. I was like, you know what? I'm going to show these people. They can say all those things about me. They could say that I was never going to you know, become anything, but I'm going to show them that they were wrong. And so in essence, I put myself back into school. I paid for it myself. I never took a bank loan. I never had a school loan. I paid every, for every studies that I did. I did it out of my own pocket. And I just worked through the process like everybody does. You know, I did uh, psych in, in undergrad. I went on to my master's, which I did leading innovation and change at York St. John University's School of Business in the United Kingdom. And then I decided, you know what? If I've got this far already, I've got the master's, why not go all the way? And so I applied for, uh, for a doctorate uh, to do my PhD um, at quite a few different universities and finally found one that would accept me, liked my proposal and found a couple of supervisors that would kind of see me through the process. And that's pretty much how I got there. And I mean, and then look, to be honest, I spent six and a half years um, doing my PhD. Sometimes I wanted to quit like anybody, you know, it gets rough. Um, the thing probably that I found the hardest was getting that kind of criticism or constructive feedback back from the supervisors <laughs> where I've always been the guy, you know, for a long time on the other side, basically leading right. the charge. Now all of a sudden I've been basically told, you know, listen, man, you know what you just wrote here is crap and you should go back and redo this. Um, but I think it was a humbling experience, you know what I mean? And I actually really enjoyed it. I like being on the other side, you know, not really knowing much and not being the expert and having to learn. And it was a serious learning journey, but I got through it. And yeah, we are. I've what what what'd you do your doctorate on? The thesis? So, yeah, um, I mean, in a nutshell, basically, if I had to define it in very simple terms, it's mindful leadership. Um, but basically what I did was I wanted to show that you could learn mindfulness through action, specifically as it relates to leadership. And so what I did actually was I took a group of leaders from different backgrounds and I took them through quote unquote, a martial art experience. And through that experience, I taught them mindfulness, how to be mindful in action. And as you understand, I mean, you know, you do what, what I do. Um, you have to be completely there, right? If you really want to do what we're doing, you need to be in the present moment. And that's when you have your best performances. So I thought, well, you know, I, I have this experience all the time. That's where I have these peak experiences. What if I could teach it to people who've never been through that? What if somebody's never done martial arts in their entire life before? They happen to be in a leadership position. I want to improve their leadership. If I take them through the thing that we just take for granted, what would be the outcome? And that's pretty much what I did. So I, I approached mindful leadership from an embodied perspective and I wanted to see if it would enhance leadership performance in action, like in the moment of leadership. And that's, that encapsulates what my thesis is about. It's amazing. It's great. It's, it's fantastic that it, you've tied it to your lifelong passion. Uh, you know, your, your original martial arts was a, a self-preservation thing. Then you turned it into a, a business and you come full circle uh, because that's, that's, that's the next chapter. You know, you and I both have sustained a ton of injuries in our experimentation over the years. We deal with pain. We deal with, with depression, if I can use that term, where sure. you know, you're used to being, you know, I, I turned, you know, 59 today. And the stuff that I want to do that my 20-year-old brain says, let's go do this. You start to move and you go, yeah, you know what, I'll just, I'll just bike today. <laughs> and, uh, uh, you, you know, so it's when you're used to being, it's, all, it's almost like, like the fighter who won't retire and he's getting, he's getting crushed now because he just can't give up the game. So it's, it's uh, but I want to, I do want to talk about that because you've been, you've been very vocal about that before 
But before we get into that, I want to finish this doctor thing. It's fascinating to me, and congratulations that that Thanks. you were able to because you could have just said, "Well, I'm going to prove you know my my mother and my family wrong, and I'm going to get a doctorate in engineering or or you know uh, Tupperware, you know uh, uh, free how to freeze meats using Tupperware, you know something ridiculous." Um, and um, it's amazing that you tied that in. The, uh, that first group, obviously big thumbs up, very positive. Your pilot test with the... Sure. I mean, a, a, you know, anybody who's done research knows it can go either way, right? It can be right. um, in a positive, positive direction or go in the opposite direction. Luckily for me, it went in a positive direction. I think the overall feedback was really good. I've been, you know, I've been lucky as well since then. And through that time, I've gone on to teach the same program and principles to other organizations. I mean, I don't know if it was last year or the year before. I uh, did some training for Google, Airbnb. I've worked for Singapore Airlines, all on a consulting basis. And really just, you know, taking this research and applying it to fields that I think, you know, in the past, I wouldn't see myself there, right? And right. That's, the, that's, the cool, that's the cool thing. It's the, the constant growth and being able to take what we do and apply it to different environments that most people wouldn't expect. I, th I think a lot of people underestimate, and it's something we talked about on one of our shows, uh, and I forget we had a cool title of it, but it, but it was something about, uh, you know, the martial arts minus the art. And, and uh, it, you know, we talked about how the, the things have changed, and I don't want to blame MMA and stuff like that, but things have changed where the bowing, the ritual, the, the, the honor, truth, integrity, and all of that has slowly been weaned out of the training, and it's just about showing up, warming up, and punching somebody in the face. And, and uh, you know, for a little bit, that might be good anger management and self-awareness, but at some point, it becomes either uh, uh, it, 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 it kind of amplifies the anger or perpetuates this, this sense of I need violence as my fix. Um, and so there's no mindfulness in that. So I, I think it's huge what you're doing and, and, and you're, what you're doing also is subtly reintroducing those ethics of the original martial arts back into these leadership people where maybe maybe in the next couple of years, you're going to inspire hundreds or thousands of people to actually start a martial art, which develops a whole other level of self-awareness and, and, and a great leader has to have good self-awareness. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, even now, I mean, I, I, you know, as you know, I, I run a studio, I still teach actively, not as much as I used to, but I'm still on the mat every week. And I would say that the vast majority of the students that I have are from those kinds of, um, genres i mean they're not they're not the street fighters you know what i mean i've been right. there, done it got the t-shirt i've had that time being there but most of my students now are in a leadership role ceos entrepreneurs uh, people who have worked really hard to get where they are but are seeking the edge and i think that we have something to offer them i think in the martial arts sense if you approach it as you were discussing you know where you take both the martial and the art seriously and you put them on an equal standing platform that they're not just one over the other I think ultimately there's a lot for people to be, you know, to gain out of that. And it's kind of sad for me when I look back and again, not to blame any specific group for this, but it's definitely is the case that the martial has overtaken the art and the whole kind of focus has become purely based on the fighting. Um, and I think there's something to be lost when you do that. Right. And I think if you get that balance back again and you both functional and at the same time, understand the philosophical underpinnings, I think you can really, change your life dramatically in a positive way. If you just go down the martial route, I think you're going to end up being, you know, down the red road and you're going to become more angry, more aggressive and more paranoid. And I can speak to that from my own experience because I've been there and that's what it did for me. It didn't make me a better person. Actually, it made me more afraid, which is kind of the interesting thing. You know, the more I learned how to fight, the more I knew how I knew how to fight. I mean, from an aggressive standpoint, even though I was winning all the time, I was the most insecure I've ever been, the most afraid I've ever been. And that kind of said something to me that there's a problem, right? I mean, that doesn't make any sense. If I'm going in every day or I'm traveling around the world and anybody that steps up to me and people who know my background know this, when I, in the past, taught seminars, I would spar with everybody. I didn't care who they were. They could be world champions. Some of these guys went on to fight in the UFC, did really, really well. I would spar everybody. So it was never that I wasn't going to step up, but 
what I found was instead of becoming more confident, having much greater self-esteem, the opposite was true. And I think the reason, and the reason I feel, this is just me personally, was that I had moved so much away from the art, so much down the martial road that I'd lost something that I think was key to really the, the kind of life performance aspect, aspect of martial arts. And so now with, I suppose I'm not as, I'm still much younger than you, but I'm, you know, I'm 45, right? <laughs> so I'm getting up and I'm getting up to, the, to the, that age where I'm starting to kind of reflect on a lot of things that I've done in the past. And I can actually understand now why all the greats, uh, you know, Moria Shiba, Funakoshi and so forth, Jigoro Kano, all talked about martial arts as a way of life. And it wasn't ultimately just about fighting. And actually, it was about transcending the fight. Mm. And so that's the funny, I, I guess that's the story for me. A funny thing happened on the way to the fight. That's how I would describe it. And what happened was I no longer wanted to fight. I love it. I love it. And I, and I can, you know, you, it, it was, man, you know, I got jumped at some seminars. I got uh, the death threats, threats like that. And you, you and I are, although this is counterintuitive for people who just look at our, maybe our marketing, our website uh, in the olden days, but we're, we are, are um, way more spiritual than people think. And our approach was always about self-defense, not about the violence. So I always tell people, I'm not teaching you how to fight. I'm teaching you how to not fight. Or, you know, back mm. even when I started in the eighties, uh, you know, I was talking my, when Panther came out with my first video in the panic attack series, the first video was, was all lecture on the cerebral self-defense, the, the mindset, the fear management, the avoidance, choice, speech, de-escalation. Nobody was doing that stuff in the eighties. And, and there wasn't a, like a, like a, an organized systemic approach to that. It was all how to get over a headlock or how to punch somebody in the face or, or, you know, how to throw a kick, how to block. So it was always the physical stuff. And, and so, you know, it's counterintuitive for people to hear this. And I love the way you, you phrased it, that the better you got, the more famous you got, the less secure, the more insecure you became. Because I remember, I remember somebody jumping me in, in Sydney, Australia. And I, was, I left that event. It was the last event on our tour. And I, flew, I was flying to go give a seminar in New York. And on the way there, I wrote in my journal that this might be my last seminar, that I'm, I'm done with it, I was so angry. I'm actually getting goosebumps now to reliving that. Because, and I was writing to myself, going, I'm just trying to make people safer. Why do people hate me? Don't hate me, hate the bad guy. I'm not the bad guy. And I realized that because the, the language that you and I both accidentally were using to describe what we were doing, we were attracting the, the, the red zone group, right? And we were attracting. Inse other insecure people who, you know, had daddy issues who wanted to learn how to fight. And then at some point yep. they wanted to fight us. And, and, uh, but you know, you talk about uh, serendipity and an epiphany cause you know, I've moved on. My next chapter is the whole no fear is like, just, I'm just talking about self-awareness and fear management and that, that if you can't manage your fear, you're not going to defend yourself. So it doesn't matter if I show you something, you got to take care of this first. And, and in, in your own parallel evolution, um, uh, at a much younger age, so you're actually way ahead of me, uh, <laughs> um, you've had this, your own epiphany. And, and, and again, um, I, love, I love how you just, I love that you have the, the integrity to say I was the most insecure I ever was at the height of my so-called, you know, violent, you know, career, violent demonstration career, what we're doing. So good, good for you. Man. Yeah. Yeah. But you know, the thing is as well, right? Nobody would have known that. Right. So unless I, unless I say that, unless I tell people that nobody would ever expect that. That's how good I was at putting on the tough guys. The well, that's, but that's, everyone's got that mask, right? I sure. mean, you know, yeah. we, we, you know, uh, uh, some people see through the mask, but most, most people, a lot of people listening to this has a, have a mask. It's your anger mask. It's your, it's your, I'm okay mask. I mean, I can't tell you how many people I know where body language is 60% of communication. I see people and because I teach mindset all the time, I can tell when somebody's fucked up, when they're fixating on something and I'm like, Hey, you okay? Yeah, yeah, everything's fine. You know, we also live in a society where it's not cool to emote. It's not cool for you, a, 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 uh, um, a martial arts self-defense icon to say that you're insecure. 
And that's yeah. what makes it cool. <laughs> so, so good on you for doing that. I want to segue into something here because mm-hmm. you've, you've written on some stuff online that I saw uh, dealing with injuries, dealing with depression, stuff like that. You've been public about it. Was, was it because that was cathartic for you? Or did you also know that if people hear you talking about it, they're going to do something about it, their own problems? I think it was the latter, to be honest. I mean, of course, it's always good to write something about something personal like that, that you know is personal, but you put it on paper and it's always going to be a therapeutic process. But again, if I, I feel like it's my duty where I am right now in this world, that especially as I have people, quote unquote, under my wings coming up, trying to learn from me and so forth, and, you know, respect me, I guess, and look up to me. It's my responsibility to tell them where I went wrong. Tell them, right. tell them the things that I did that if I could go back, I would change it. Um, that that wasn't the best way to do things. I mean, part of that whole thing of always stepping up, no matter who it was and always sparring is part of the reasons why my body is trashed. Right. Um, I mean, for the first time, probably in my entire time that I've been in martial arts, which is pretty much my whole life and been teaching, I've actually got to the point now where if I'm on the mat anywhere in the world and I feel that that person, all they want to do is just basically kick my ass so that they can go and tell everybody that they did it before that even happens. If I get that sense, I'm like, I don't want to do this. And I'll get up and just walk off the mat. I never did that. Right. I mean, that, that, that's really hard for my ego to do, to basically say, you know what? I'm not going to do this. Not, not if for anything else. One, I think it's bad for you that we're going to have this interaction. I don't think it's positive for your mindset. But second of all, I'm putting my health at risk here. I mean, I'm the, you know, I've been basically diagnosed with degen in my neck. It's really quite severe. I've had to step back a lot from sparring, a lot from rolling. I mean, I still do, but I have to be very careful who I do it with now. Um, sparring in itself, I've probably backed off the most just purely because I was having some weird Um, symptoms after every time I sparred for the last few years where literally I would go into this kind of depressive state where my my head felt like it was full of cotton wool. You know, I couldn't get my, my, my thoughts straight. I was just really messed up for like days on end. And initially I didn't recognize it as such. I just thought something weird was going on. Right. But then when I, when I started to have breaks in between sparring and then I would come back to sparring again and have the same experience again, I started putting two and two together. And I realized, you know what, actually, there's something going on here. There's something not right. And I had to go and, you know, seek the appropriate help, which I've done. Um, you know, I don't, nobody knows really what the problem is. I mean, if we start talking about CTE and things like that, which is very common these days and fighters and stuff, um, this was something that, and you would probably agree to this, man, we were, you know, you've been in it longer than I have, but definitely when we were coming up, nobody ever had that conversation. Nobody said, hey, listen, this is probably not a good way to train. And, you know, when you're 50, you're going to really, really, you know, you're going to battle because you trained this way. You're going to regret that you went this route. Um, Nobody had that conversation. It was just kind of a a standard norm. You just thought that's what you were supposed to do, right? You go in, you bang away at each other 100%. And if you're not prepared to do that, you have no right to be there. And that's kind of the school that I came from. Um, And now, in hindsight, I would never do that again. And so my thinking is let me put it out there let me just be honest and say listen this is what i'm struggling with this is what's going down listen to me i'm telling you now even if you're just somebody that's a hobbyist and you just do it a couple of times a week don't think that this can't happen to you i would argue that actually a lot of times it's more risk for those people because they're not training consistently then they come in like twice a week and they go crazy 100 miles an hour and they just put their their, their entire health at risk by doing that Right. Um, we know now that you can be freaking headering, headering like a soccer ball or something like a ball and you can get, uh, you know, issues from that brain issues from that, just from the, the, the concussion that you can get mild concussions. Right. So I mean, these are the things that we know now that we didn't know before. And it would be, I think it would be, um, it would be, a, it would be irresponsible of me not to actually talk about it and not put it out there. Right. Well said. I mean, I, I used to bring up back in the day, I mean, years ago, you know, it was a r- real I still am boxing, big fan of boxing, but I was really following it back in the day. And I feel like, uh, you know, other than the golden years of, of, of boxing, you know, I grew up with the uh, Sugar Ray Leonard fought Duran in Montreal. And I, I spent two weeks with Sugar Ray, you know, during the lead up to the fight. I was 20. He was 24. It was the most surreal experience, you know, being with him. But it was the, you know, Hagler, Hearns, Sugar Ray, you know, uh, era. 
And, um, and I, I remember, cause I always, I had intuitively when I would spar, there were days we would go hard, like, let's say like doing hill sprints as a metaphor, you know, but then there were days when I'd go for a walk. And so walking in the metaphor here is we would do isolation drills, just jabbing, just, okay, you jab and I got to throw a right, just trying to work on proximity sense and timing and balance and, and, and not blinking and, and the emotional psychological relationship. So we really, um, we, we didn't smash each other all the time, but I used to, like you, I ran my school for like, you know, almost two decades by myself, had a couple of assistants, but I just wrote something that, he, that my love for martial arts was so great that I probably would have worked out seven days a week, but I wouldn't have worked out 35 or 40 times a week, but I did because I was teaching the morning class, the afternoon class, the night class and private classes. And, and I sparred and did scenarios with everybody. And there was one point in the mid eighties where my speech started to slur and I was always had a headache. And I just, uh, 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 I remember watching, uh, and, uh, it was an, it was some fighter interview and he was punch drunk from all of the shit. And it just said, I said, like, is that's what's happening to me? Cause I was like, literally, I was only 28 and my speech was starting to slur. And as soon as I backed off, like everything resumed and that re and I, and I remember telling people talking about, you know, Duran, when he used to fight, he used to try and knock everybody out. And then Carlos Monzon used to spar very lightly with people leading up to the fight. And both went uh, 10 years undefeated. And so just like, you know, you, you, you know, you got a PhD, like just in terms of an empirical experiment, I go, who is right? Duran went 10 years undefeated, going balls to the walls as hard as he could. Monzon went 10 years undefeated all technique more like uh, my buddy Kyrian does at CSA, you know, they are like, like they protect the head. They, and, and you recognize that hey, you're in a full contact sport. You've got to stress inoculate a little bit, but let's not be macho or bravado uh, uh, about it. So I love the message. I love what you, you're, you're sharing there. Um, I, do you have aside from sharing? I mean, it was very eloquent the way you said it, you have a duty or responsibility to share it for people listening to this, because everyone's an aging athlete, right? I got cops listening to this. I got military listening to this. I got martial artists, CrossFitters. Um, the day I release it, you're not going to listen to it. A day later, you're going to listen to it. You're a day older. So everyone's an aging athlete here. Everyone's an aging martial artist, self-defense practitioner. Any specific or generic advice to the aging athlete, aside from what you just said here is like, hey, TBI, traumatic brain injury, that's no joke. Take care, do what you gotta do, right? Uh, but, but watch your brain. Yeah, absolutely. I think what, what you have to also do is you have to ask why you're doing it. Like, what is, what is the end goal here? I mean, are you just doing it for one year? Are you gonna do it for the rest of your life? Do you still wanna be doing this when you're 60, when you're 65? Uh, what's the point? What's the purpose, right? And I mean, obviously that might change over time, but if I look at myself now and where I am right now, what I want out of this is very different to what I wanted out of it at 20. Right. But I still would have appreciated the conversation. I'm not sure if I would have listened at right. 20, but it would have been nice to have mentors around me that basically said, listen, man, you know, the way you're carrying on right now is going to be a real problem when you get older. Nobody had that conversation, right? And so I think it's important to have the conversation. I do think it's important to reflect on why are you actually doing it? What's the main purpose here? Are you training for self-preservation? Are you training? This is the thing, right? So like some people will come in and they will train in the combat sports environment. They have no intention of ever competing. They're never going to compete. They know they're not going to, but yet they will go crazy in training with people in sparring and get completely lit up or try to light other people up 100 miles an hour for what? You know, not even that you would want to do that even if you were competing. But the point is, is that, man, this is just something you do during the week amongst everything else that you do, right? Being a father, whatever that may be, right? So I think people need to ask why they're actually doing it. What is, what is the purpose? What is the point? And do I still want to be able to do this in 10 years time? And that's what I had to ask myself. If I'm still going to want to be able to do this in 10 years time, I'm going to have to change the way that I'm training. There's no way that I can keep carrying on doing this. Of course, there are people who just seem to not care about that. Right. There was recently, there was recently Vandele Silva was talking about the fact that he now knows that he's got serious 
problems from all the time that he went so hard. There's definitely, obviously, uh, you know, there's brain injuries there and so forth. What did he turn around? He acknowledged all of that. He said, but I'm still going to do it. That's a personal choice. But at the end of the day, it's not just a personal choice, right? How does that impact all the people around him that love him? Right. You know, his family, his children and so forth, his wife. I mean, of course, you need to think of the bigger game there. Yeah, it's huge. Wow, that's that's a that's a great answer, and it ties into uh, my my big wrap up question. And we'll have you on again. I just I want to keep this one super tight and, and educational. Uh, and I've thought about this a lot for myself, but I want to ask you this: knowing like like chronic pain is no joke. I mean, uh, you know, you've had neck issues. I've had, I've had a neck issue since 1986, every single day. Um, and, and, and I know you've, you've suffered through that too. And there's days for people listening here. And again, we got a lot of first responders on this. Like every combat athlete I know has some sort of injury or pain, right? But would we be who we are? If knowing what we know now, we could go back in time machine and go, bah. so if somebody said, because if you change this, it's like some science fiction movie. Well, don't change that because you change the future. And it's the ripple effect. You know, if you could go back in time and, and change something, you know, what would you change? And then my philosophical answer, not to contaminate what you're going to think and you're, you're your own man, is... I've often said, and this is just where I'm at spiritually, philosophically now, is I couldn't change anything because everything that happened to me brought me to this realization where I'm at right now. But I would, and I agree with you 100%, as a coach, as a mentor to other people, I got to go, okay, slow down before you, <laughs> I got to tell you a little story. But I want, I want to hear your, your answer will be interesting. Go for it. Yeah, I think, look, my answer to that is going to be about my students. And so let, let me give you an example. Like if I look at my students that do jujitsu with me, I would say right now that anybody in my academy that's a blue belt is much better than I ever was as a blue belt. And not by a small margin. I mean, by a massive amount. Like they're really a million times better than I am. Right. I mean, probably where, where they are as, as a really good blue belt, I probably was there maybe at the end of purple belt if I was lucky. So what does that tell me? It tells me that the way that I'm approaching training now and how I'm setting it up for my students is really making a huge difference. And I'm proving both to myself and to them that if you take a very different approach, you can still get massive performance out of people right. without subjecting them to all the things we've been talking about. So I'm big on uh, what I call play, challenge play, where you basically, you know, just work against yourself. Stop trying to measure yourself against everybody else. It's about coming in and getting 1% better than you were yesterday. Am I better than I was yesterday? Even if it's 1%, that's all that matters. That the person in front of you is not your opponent. It's not the person that's there for you to destroy. Without that person, you don't get to train. So actually you need to learn to collaborate. You need to treat them with respect. You need to also be in a position that you are willing to help them because by helping them improve their game, your game improves. And so you have to take the ego out of it and you have to play more. And that's really hard. I'll be honest. I'll be, I would say to you that that's probably the, the biggest obstacle I have when I teach people is trying to get them to understand this different way because they've been completely um, saturated in our everyday society about this whole obsession with competition, the survival of the fittest, all these kinds of things, these paradigms that have shoved, basically shoved down our throats. And then I come in and say, hold on, there's another way. It's very difficult for people to kind of grasp that. But then once they have the experience, once they start seeing that they're getting much better through a different approach to training, which is just a lot more about collaboration, like I said, a lot more about play, a lot more about personal challenge, not competing against other people and just taking it easy. You know what I mean? It's like sometimes slow is good, right? Or maybe a lot right. of times slow is good. Like sometimes you have to go slow to go fast. And so just them realizing that tells me that had I had that experience, so let's say I had a coach that took me under their wing when I was young and approached it in that way. I think I would have a lot less injuries first off. And second of all, I would be a lot better. And I say that for myself too, is that yes, even though I backed off from sparring and all this kinds of stuff because the things I discussed, the interesting thing to me is if I put gloves on 
and I do step on the mat and I do spar people and I'm not going to mention names. But some of these people when I'm around traveling around the world are really well-known fighters in their own right. I do perfectly fine. And to be honest, I shouldn't be considering how much I'm training because I'm training so, you know, so, so, so limit, limited in what I'm doing compared to them. These guys are on the mat every day. They're training like real athletes, right? They, 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 they're, they're at the high end of that combat athletic spectrum. I'm like on the lower end. I'm just kind of like coasting and I'm just taking it real easy and stuff like that. But I can still step on the mat and do okay. Why is that? Because I changed the way that I train. So actually, I think the way that I do things now is far more intelligent, far better. And actually, ironically, I think I'm better now than I ever was when I was in my early 20s. That's amazing. Yeah, no, I, it, that all resonates with me, man. And I will say this, that um, like I said at the beginning of the show, there's, there's a lot of people out there. Well, there's a bunch of people out there that are really talented, but they can't articulate this stuff you know you're you're truly a coach uh and and um i i will say this not to be a contrarian i mean this sincerely that your ability to articulate this and what you uh um dreamt and then and then created a vision for and then executed on you and you with, with with regard to your phd and the doctorate I don't believe that that would have happened had you not taken the path. Um, and it's just, it's just, it's just like a, like a, like a, like a spiritual romantic perspective of mine that had that the reason you didn't have a coach take you under the ring when you're 12 and say, Hey, here's a different way is because nobody knew about that different way. You're one of the guys that because you're introspective figured it out. And, uh, and, and so, you know, we need people like you in the arts and the system, writing books, articles and, and shit like that. So, so, you know, it's one of those trick questions, like what would you do different? And the real answer is if you're truly making a difference, then you couldn't do anything different because your, your self-awareness and situational awareness would be completely different. And, and, uh, that's just my perspective is, uh, so, so. I'm, I'm, I'm impressed and I'm happy for you. And I, and I, listen, I, I wish, because I think we've got similar problems, both with, with, uh, uh, people in the arts, uh, uh, people we've mentored, but also more importantly, uh, uh, uh the stress and the pain of dealing with the pain because as you know, the, the path less traveled wasn't even a path for some of the stuff that we did. And, and we did crazy things to our body in the intuitive name or the, in the name of intuitive experimentation and science. Like we had a vision, I'm going to go here. Um, but I, I've, I've thought about this deeply. I don't think that, I don't think I would have the insights and the ability to articulate what I'm articulating if I hadn't fucking done the shit I was doing. So, um, so yeah, but here we are kicking ass. Yeah, no, I mean, I, I I totally, I totally agree. I mean, look, I agree with you. I mean, I needed to go through what I had to go through to get where I am. Right. The most important um, thing is, is that you're, you're expressing it both, uh, in your online programs, your live programs, your writing, and people will listen to this and just listening to this, it's, it's going to impact people and they're going to rethink how they train at the end of the day. If it's like when we do our one day bureau and bodyguard class, a lot of like, you know, martial artists out there that if you ask them, can you learn to defend yourself in a day? They'll say, no, that's a scam. That's bullshit. And I know statistically that there are more people who defend themselves every day with no training whatsoever. They just decide through indignation, I'm going to fight back. And it's some fat lady here or some young teenager or whatever. And that's the switch in the class. And that's what I want everyone listening to this. The, the, the decision to protect yourself or your family and get violent has nothing to do with how hard you spar and smash your brain. So you can, you can, once you, once you flip that switch where you go, I will protect myself and my family, no matter what, like that, that kid that uh, charged that gunman last week mm. in North Carolina, uh, you know, like he didn't study martial arts and Kung Fu and gun disarms. And he, and he gave up his life to save friends of his and, and to not be a victim I ended up, ended up losing his life in the altercation. But it's the mindset part that that is most critical and if you get that then you can learn to find 
a trainer or coach or a club or a school that understands what Rodney's talking about, this, this uh, uh, play. Uh, there's a bunch of drills that, that we do in our system that are, they're, they're, they're totally co uh, cooperative. You can't do them without this, this essence of play. And they're, they're the drills where I've got to stop the class and I go, okay, you're all having too much fun. You're practicing violence. Everyone stop laughing and enjoying yourself. And everyone laughs. But it's that, that whole thing is like, you know, you can't, you can't just uh, practice killing people and not being killed all the time without it having a, 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 a noxious effect on your psyche. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's, I agree, and I've written about that quite a lot. Right? I mean, that's my perception of a lot of people, spe specifically people who are teaching in that way. And I think they, they're not only are they in that state where they're in the red road and they're doing themselves a serious disservice, but they're doing that to everybody else. And actually, when, if you really want, yeah, if you really want to get people to get really good at what we're talking about is, you know, let them get lost in it, let them enjoy it, let them have fun, you know, let time basically disappear you know, just before you know it, the hour is up. And ultimately, when they step off wherever they are off the mat or, you know, out of the, the, the room where you've just done the seminar, do they reflect on that and go, you know what? I actually learned something really valuable about myself today. Mm, I like that. That to, me, that, to, that to me is far more important, right? I mean, because as you know, I mean, there are people all over the world right this second while we're talking that are protecting themselves, that are defending themselves and the people that they love and have never done a single day of martial arts training. 100%. So then we, then we have to ask ourselves, well, that's what I ask myself. Well, then what's my point? Here? What's my purpose? So what am I actually doing? Am I actually teaching people self-defense or defense of the self? And I would argue that I'm teaching people defense of the self in the sense that getting them to know themselves better so that they don't have to ever put themselves in positions where they may have to use what we teach them. And if they do, they do only just enough to do what they need to do and get themselves to a position of safety. But more than that, it's about how, do, how does these, these lessons that we teach them infiltrate and impact their everyday life, right? Because, you know, maybe I teach somebody how to defend themselves, so to speak, but they may never be called upon to use that. But the one thing I'm sure that they're going to use is the stuff that I teach them about self-management in dealing with the martial arts of everyday life. And that could be the toxic boss, you know, just the jerk at work, right. dealing with, uh, you know, try getting to work in the morning and stuck in traffic again and not going into a kind of a rage and uh, road rage and things like that. That's really important. So when people come to me and they go, you know what, man, I just felt so much calmer this week at work. Nothing stressed me out. I felt just in tune with myself. And it's because I've been coming here and training. That to me speaks more then now trying to get people obviously all hyped up and aggressive and paranoid and, you know, think that there's freaking somebody out to get them on every street corner. I love it. Confrontation management, man. I love it. Um, Rodney, what's the best way for people to learn more about the program? And, and is your, uh, is this new program online? Like, are you doing you have uh, an online course yet? Yeah, I mean, I've got, a, I've got a mental game course that I put together, but it's more for sparring, but it has a lot of these elements that I've been talking about. Best place for people to get hold of me now is just at coachrodneyking.com. I've kind of shifted everything over into that site, all my courses, my blog, my writing, everything that I do is there. And so that's, that's the easiest way to kind of just track what I'm doing. Dig it. Man, I'll have you on the show uh, many more times. I really enjoyed this call. And uh, it's great to catch up uh, with you. Any, um, any parting thoughts for the group? I mean, you were very eloquent and, 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 and softly forceful. I think, I think, that, I think that the, the, message, the, message, the message is profound. And it's almost, you know, like I listened to it. Uh, you, know, I was, you know, I felt like I was, I felt like I was in a seminar, like listening to you, right? Like it's a, it's a deep, profound message. And it, it resonates with me. And, and, you know, you said something about 15 minutes ago that, you know, uh, where if a coach, you wish your coach had said, shared some of these thoughts with you, but who knows if you to listen, that was the key thing, right? Is like, I, you know, I've got three kids and I'm regularly texting videos and, and links to like real kind of self-awareness, spiritual stuff. And I, I always include, please watch this. You probably won't save it. 
you'll watch it when you're 30 or 40. I wish, I wish when I was 20, somebody had given this to me. And I know that they're not looking at it, right? But they're, they're probably like, oh, my crazy dad, he's into that like spiritual shit and he's trying to, you know, but it's, it's funny. We go through the stuff we think is a, that, that is important when we're 20 is completely different when we're 30, completely different when we're 40. And I will tell you this, it's different when you're in your 50s. So Yeah, I'm sure. Well, yeah. my, my parting words would be thanks for having me and happy birthday. Uh -huh. Thank you, brother. Hey, uh, we'll definitely uh, uh, stay in touch and, and, and keep this going. Cool, man. Appreciate it. Thanks. Thanks, bud.